How much do you know about DevOps? When did you first start learning about it? Who were your teachers? Now, imagine what it would feel like to teach DevOps to a high school student. Our next speaker, Daniel, is already doing it. He has been helping teach DevOps to high schoolers through his work with BitProject, a nonprofit focusing on tech education. In this talk, you'll hear about what it was like to make DevOps accessible to beginner developers. You'll also see some student projects that incorporated CICD and infrastructure. I think you'll also feel pretty inspired about the future. Enjoy. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel and welcome to my talk, DevOps for High Schoolers. I'm super excited to deliver this talk at GitLab Commit Virtual 2021. And later on in the presentation, I'll be introducing my friend Emily, who's a high schooler, and she'll be talking about her experience learning about DevOps and her experience actually building uh, this talk and also um, this workshop with me um, as a high schooler. So yeah, let's just get right into it. So hello, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm a senior developer relations engineer at New Relic. I'm also the president and founder of BitProject, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that helps students launch their first projects, learn about tech, and learn really cool new technical frameworks and skills to maybe launch their next app. So a couple things to know about me. Um, I'm pretty new to DevOps. Uh, I started with DevOps uh, when I started at my current company, New Relic. Before then, I was working a lot with Next.js and Gatsby and front-end development. I have a pretty short attention span. I love learning actively and hands-on. I don't really like reading textbooks or watching super long YouTube videos. I like to learn by doing. And that kind of influences how I like to teach people as well. Uh, I love GIFs, as you will see throughout this presentation. And I actually have a long history with GitLab Commit, I think it was the second tech conference I've ever been to in my entire life. Um, the first one, uh, after the first one, I was so pumped. I was hooked into the whole tech conference scene, all from like the bagels to like the fancy green juices. Amazing, I love it. And I also I get to talk about, talk about technical things with other engineers. And yeah, so um, next to my face, there are some pictures of me holding my badge when I went to the GitLab Commit conference in San Francisco. A uh, couple, couple years ago. I think that was last year, actually. Yeah, when I was still a student. So yeah, I'm super excited to come back to GitLab Commit and contribute back to the conference that brought me so much joy when I attended in person in 2020. Um, last thing is, um, I'm on Twitter at Learn with Daniel. So feel free to follow me and connect with me on Twitter. I'm pretty cool, so let's be friends. Okay. So let's just get right into it. So like when we thought, think about DevOps, right? Um, we think about a lot of things, but when I Googled DevOps for the first time and went to the images in GIFs tab, I saw this GIF of this man holding like six devices, all furiously typing while the room is on fire. And especially when you're learning about DevOps for the first time, seeing an image like this being the representation of a particular field doesn't make it the most appealing to get into. It seems very intense and overwhelming. And, you know, it is. So when we think about DevOps like as a practitioner or when we read blog posts or technical documentation about DevOps, we hear a lot of these like words like infrastructure, observability, sysops, Docker, AWS, Kubernetes, um, SLA, CICD, all these two, three, four letter acronyms that mean a bunch of different things. And this type of jargon is what? Very intimidating, especially for people who are very new, students, um, even practitioners who are not the most deep into DevOps. It can be very, very overwhelming. So when I first joined New Relic, I was like, so yeah, I gotta bring my Daniel Flair into what I'm doing. So how do I make the things that my company is doing more accessible and most importantly, more fun? So this is why we introduced uh, a workshop called Error and Prod at FutureStack, which is our annual user conference. So what is Error and Prod? Error and Prod is a cool, fun, exciting, fabulous, amazing, cool extravaganza. Yay, love GIFs. Uh, introducing students to site reliability engineering. So today during this talk, I wanna talk a little bit about how we make things more accessible and how we 
uh, and the lessons learned uh, that me and Emily learned from building a DevOps workshop for high schoolers. So let's just jump right into it. So the first lesson we learned very early on was to make it relatable. So what does that mean? So that means usually answering the question, why should people care? Because let's be honest, going through the same hello world getting started guide in the documentation for the seventh time to try to understand what's going on is a very fun. So this is where I bring in my friend Lizzie. Um, I tweeted that I'll be including her in the presentation. So Lizzie, if you're watching, hey, this is me, Daniel. Um, Lizzie is now my friend, but back in the day, like uh, when I was a freshman in college, she was a uh, developer evangelist at Twilio and I was just a humble student. And she actually came to our school. Uh, I went to UC Davis, so she went, came to Hack Davis and she did this amazing demo where she put up a Twilio phone number on the, on the, like on the screen and she had every single person like at the event text that number with like a phrase and we'd get something back from the number and that was such an interesting demo for me because it wasn't just like hey go follow the tutorial it's more like an interactive demonstration of how something works without telling someone verbatim how it works so i got so much inspiration from that demo to like create my own twilio projects and that's why twilio is so prevalent in a lot of my personal fun projects um, because it's so easy to work with and I had a great introduction from uh, Lizzie. So that's kind of like what I learned is that we shouldn't do stuff for the sake of the demo and we need to help folks understand the context of what they're doing. So here are the two questions I would answer when I'm trying to make a demo is when would I use this and who would I use this and make sure that I can answer those questions before I can present it to an audience. So here's what we did at, uh, for Air and Prod. So we used a real production e-commerce app with simulated outages to teach students about site reliability engineering. We call it Nerd Mart because we call ourselves data nerds. Uh, so instead of like messing with production code, we found that students didn't really relate to that content and a lot of students found it really overwhelming. We pre-instrumented and pre-connected all of the data from the production application to a user interface that was no code. And students were debugging that application that was in production using the various tooling that our, uh, that our product provides. So they were doing the things that site reliability engineers do, like digging through logs and looking at various charts and graphs to figure out what's going on. Because that introduces the high level concept of what site reliability engineers do and what kind of data they have access to but without going so deep into the stack where we actually touch source code. So we tried to answer the question like, why should they care? So like going through things like, why is this website loading really slowly? Or why is this image just refusing to load? And using data and using a platform that was easily understandable to kind of help students understand, okay, this is what happens underneath the hood when a lot of these things that happen to you in your daily life, like when you buy Furbies at 3 a.m. in the morning on Amazon because you're feeling impulsive, that's like, that's, that's kind of the things that we want uh, to introduce students to. So yeah, now I want to introduce Emily. Emily is a high schooler at Panther Creek High School in North Carolina, and she was instrumental in bringing this workshop to life. So yeah, take it away, Emily. Hi, my name is Emily, and I'm a student DevRel at Fib Project, which is a nonprofit Daniel actually just talked about. A part of that, I'm also a rising senior at Panther Creek High School. And like I said before, um, this is also my first fun fact. Fun fact. My second fun fact is that I'm discovering DevOps. So previously, I didn't know this was even a viable um, entryway into the tech industry. I only knew about you know people coding, sitting at the desk all day. But now that I've learned from this workshop and many other things at the nonprofit, DevOps is actually really important in keeping my favorite tech services alive and working, so that I can use it. So providing accessibility for that. Third fun fact, um, this is my third tech conference ever. So um, I've only been to two, been and spoken at two conferences before. I was at one that was themed Animal Crossing. So that's pretty cool. But let's get started. So Daniel just talked about why and how we can make people um, interested in this. And um, the question, we answer the questions of like, you know, why would they use this and how would they use this? 
And by doing that, we're really pulling them in, pulling them in. we're grabbing their attention. However, how do we keep that attention? Well, we can have a story. And I'm gonna start this off with a couple of games that I'm very familiar with. I'm not sure if you guys are, but how do games keep children engaged? So as a kid, I played a lot of Pop Tropica. I played Club Penguin and my friends played Maple Story. Um, these games all have one thing in common. They all have stories. So like in Pop Tropica, there were different islands and you could play at each one. Like there was a Diary of a Wimpy Kid Island. Um, in Club Penguin, you can be a spy. There's all kinds of stories that really keep children engaged and surprised. These um, tactics actually apply to students and very often even adults. So um, since we have stories, of course, we got to have characters. And um, in our case, having characters keeps students more engaged and obviously is essential to good storytelling. Like name one story that um, doesn't have a character. That's just not possible. In Cl Pop Tropica, you are the main character. In Club Penguin, your friends could be um, the Doja Master, etc. There's a lot, lots of ways um, characters make a, a game just more um, interesting. So for our workshop, we have two characters. One, the first one is Debug. So Debug is the hacker extraordinaire. They're the villain and Debug loves to cause chaos in production. So this is a character in the story that we're trying to fight against. Second, meet the security engineer. This is gonna be you, or in other words, um, the person who's playing the workshop, the student who's learning about DevOps. So the security engineer, um, they're stressed out, they want coffee. They're trying to find Debug, get it? debug. And uh, once again, this is the main character. This is you. Um, us humans, we're very inclined to think that we are the main character. So um, now this may sound narcissistic, but that is um, what grabs people's attention. The ability to, ability to think that you're the one who's solving problems in the world. All right. So how do we scope DevOps for beginners? So we just talked about having story and, you know, how Hello World isn't enough. We need to show that this um, particular workshop with skills they're learning are important. But even if we use all of that, there's still one section left over. We have to make it um, appealing to people who haven't, you know, used all of this jargon, three-letter acronyms, things like that. So First things first, config issues suck. Um, no one wants to spend more than 10 minutes setting up, in their, setting up their environment. So as many of you probably know, installing Python is a very tiring process, especially if you don't have the right versions, et cetera. So think about it. Does the work workshop require Docker versions, Python versions, a PyNV? What other packages do they need to install? And oftentimes they might be incompatible on different operating systems. So these are all things to think about before you try to shove um, the workshop into someone with a different operating system than you, or just simply, you know, different versions, as you know, different environments, it's just a huge hassle. Second, is it accessible? So can someone with a really crappy laptop join in? And think about it, once again, this is kind of relating to the version and config issues. You know, does something need to be installed? Um, does someone need to have a very powerful machine? What if they try to run your workshop and their machine overheats and it's just a really bad experience? That would put anyone off and not make them want to continue and persevere. And of course, can it be simplified? It's always good to simplify anything to make it more appealing because uh, you, you don't want, the purpose of this workshop is, is not to make someone set up an environment, it's to make someone um, learn DevOps. And um, thirdly, how is it not overwhelming? So like I said before, there's three letter acronyms. You know, people don't know what those mean. Reading those on a screen with long paragraphs of text are not ideal to grab someone's attention and make this overall more accessible. So don't make it super technical and make sure it's not intimidating. And here are some um, factors we considered. You know, is the content really badly formatted? Um, does it sound like a rocket science course? And does it sound like a course syllabus? So those three points, all of this makes DevOps unappealing and overbearing. And particularly for, particularly for me, it's the environment setup that really resonates. And so 
how do we make it engaging? And finally, we're at the conclusion. So here was our solution to the three main problems I just listed before. One, our workshop is all in browser, so it's very accessible. They don't need any coding skills to access it. Um, and since the concepts are so foreign, we don't want to um, push more new coding, um, new, new uh, languages or syntax onto them. And we do not want to introduce unnecessary complexity. So everything's in the browser. Anyone, even a Chromebook could access it. Two, it's a game with leaderboard and prizes. This is a very large motivator for a lot of people. I personally am very motivated by leaderboards, earning points, seeing my username climb up the screen. That's always something that um, keeps me engaged and keeps me wanting to continue playing. And finally, we answered why. So we, um, we explained why non-SREs should care about uptime. And like Daniel talked about before in the first part, this is a big um, step to overcoming the hello world part of things. You know, just making people print out hello world does not show them how this applies to the real world. And lastly, some questions to answer. And after this whole spiel, um, when would I use this and who would use this? Well, when would I use this? Honestly, you could apply these skills almost anywhere. DevOps is very encompassing when it, term, it comes in terms to computing. You have to work with code, you have to work with business, um, you have to keep things operating. And personally, I've applied these skills um, much farther out into uh, the field in, in tech other than just working out errors and keeping things running. Who would use this? Well, you have solution architects, you have developer advocates, you have engineering managers, you have Daniel, you have customer enablement, and honestly, anyone doing technical demos. So when you're um, when you're creating technical demos, whether it's a workshop or it's just you know showing off a product, keep these in mind for um, if you're trying to get your if your target audience includes beginners. So, call to action: Go ahead and try our fun workshop now. The link is on the slide. And also, we are creating a series of workshops just like these to introduce beginners to DevOps. So um, contact, contact us. Our Twitter usernames are on the slide and as well as all the other ones. And we'd love to work together. We had a pleasure talking with you all today. So thank you so much for listening. And as always, keep on doing DevOps. I don't know how to end this talk, but yeah, have a great day.